Um, and we are just glad to be here w with Mr. Dangerman. Uh, so, quick question, Mr. Dangerman. Uh, I know we have an audience of a lot of folks. Let us know who Mr. Dangerman really is. Like, outside of the the big uh, stage and the things that we usually see you at the UC, tell us about Mr. Jack Dangerman. Well, we are in Palm Springs, first off. This is a warm day. We're burning the virus off of our skin, so it's, <laughs> it's really healthy. We're surrounded by about a thousand people that are S3 business partners that are here to learn from each other and learn how to do business from each other. And so it's, it's really great to be here and I appreciate you doing this interview and doing this launch. I mean, it's Thank pretty you. cool. But you asked me a fundamental question. Who am I? Uh, I'm, I'm just, we're just, uh, wondering, uh, what do I respond to that? I mean, you're making me scared. <laughs> Don't be. So, so, Mr. Dave, so, most people ask like the president what's on your ipod or like what's your favorite food what we're just trying to say is hey this great giant that we see of of jack dangerman like who is mr jack Dangerman? what do you like who's your favorite football what's your favorite football team or I sports say that. I mean, kind of, you know, oh yeah i can't do that yeah, you're right you, you have international folks okay good 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 where are you originally from uh, i was born in the same town i live now I my parents were dutch immigrants over around the twentieth century, and they were poor. And they were, my mother was a maid. My father was a gardener. Some of them, yeah. And they they uh, they wanted their kids to go to school because they worked for all these rich people. And they said, uh, "Allison, Pete, you should get your kids in there." And they couldn't afford it, so they started a little nursery right after the war. And we all grew up living in a tent in the nursery and uh, growing plants and selling plants and. So the origins of me are in service, you know, being in service to other people who have needs. And so for me, people ask, well, how did you get this philosophy of us really serving the customers? And it's grounded in that you know, background. And they, they taught me all the ethics I needed to have. They were very religious. And they taught me to keep agreements. They taught me to treat our customers well. And don't break any agreement. It's the same thing that, that I'm sure happened in your life. Sure. So I'm grounded in that. And I'm not grounded in fancy. So when you see me on stage, it's probably the most awkward time. Oh, wow. 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 Have wow. you, you get afraid in front? Yes, I do. I'm afraid in front of this uh, virtual audience. Mm -hmm. It's awkward. Yeah. And, and so, Mr. Danger, like I told you before, this is let. This is LinkedIn Live. Yeah. So we don't know how many people we're looking at. It could at. be three. It could be three. It could be 30. 30. It could be millions or no, whatever. No, it's not millions. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully. We're scared. You know. I know. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Um, so, Mr. Dangerman, one of the things that we are in, so as you know from the, the uh, partners conference, or partners conference, uh, is the coronavirus. Yeah. And so I know that John Hopkins University, a lot of help, uh, who? Uh, the World Health uh, organization, WHO, yeah. WHO, they're doing a lot in regards to the coronavirus. I know that this conference kind of got affected by the coronavirus. Yes. As GIS professionals, can we talk or, or kind of talk about what we can do to support the epidemic? Well, the, the epidemic uh, that happened uh, in West Africa, the Ebola conference, uh, con the epidemic uh, a few years ago, was literally shut down using geography and the science of quarantine and seeing where patterns were and how it was spreading. This virus is a little different. It's uh, it's going viral, so to speak, more like SARS did. And so the first thing that people are typically doing is trying to understand these spatial patterns of it and how it moves. And that's where web maps are uh, helping a lot. The John Hopkins uh, group at the university there, Johns Hopkins group, uh, are getting updates every 10 minutes right. of the virus and they're serving it on the line so you can see basically dots on maps and then heat maps on maps and it's it's gone viral in the sense that it's making between one and two billion maps a day so the world now understands 
uh, in the dashboards and in the story maps what's what's going on. So one of my best friends said, understanding precedes action. This is Richard Saul Worman, the guy who started TED. Yeah. He really inspired me because maps are, in a way, stories about geographic phenomena. If you think about that for a minute, it's, it's very powerful. We are telling the story dynamically through a dynamic map of the emergence and the spread of this, this plague here. Yeah. And it has the impact of people's perception. Now, health people tell us it's not any more serious than, or not much more serious than the common cold. But for old people, people like me, we did it. Yeah. He'll be around at the, uh, he'll be at the UC. Don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah, right. I'll be there. <laughs> but, uh, so then, you know, what happened with Ebola was people were able to set up spatial uh, spatial patterns, and we got into a box and we shut it down. And what Bill Gates did with polio was the same thing in Ethiopia and in, and in um, uh, Nigeria. They got it into a box by making sure everybody got immunized, and it just so it was very geography played a major role in that. It's yet to be known what what what's going to happen with this virus. We just don't know. And uh, so I wish I could give you insight. All I can do is, is creating understanding. And as I understand it in China, they're trying to link the spread of the disease with mobile phone and big data so they can see who is the carrier and how they move and how it really fueled the epidemic. But still, there's no solution. And the solutions, I think, will come when it, with, with vaccines and with um, you know, all, all the, the medical professions open. Uh, it's a powerful tool, maps are a powerful tool. So, uh, today in, in the session, it's very funny that you said this. I remember being a student assistant, um, in 2003 when I was in graduate school. And I remember you saying, getting up and you were saying, Hey, we want to have maps and we want to have connect the world. And I was like, You said this. And I was like, This guy's crazy. Yeah, uh, did. I was like, This guy's crazy because it didn't make any sense. Yeah. And now we have web maps. I know that we talked about that today. But one of the things I, I, I really want to have a, a candid conversation is you said something today about, uh, the, the geospatial infrastructure, yeah. right? You wanted us to go there. So can you kind of, I know that we, most people are not here at the Partners Conference, but what is your vision in regards to that geospatial infrastructure? Well, when, when I started early in my career, we did GIS projects. These were really about taking different layers of geographic data, digital data, and then overlaying them and modeling them and doing a project. Like, where should I locate a new town? Or how should I minimize my impact on the environment, or where should I target new housing, or whatever it was. And those are projects I thought, that's a pattern. And millions of projects get done every year, one by one, people conceive of it, they design it, and then they go after that project. And in the, in the 80s, we began to see that you could store and reuse information as you would in a DBMS system, a database management system. You could Record systems of record and for land records or for, for utility or for roads. We would build these second type of pattern systems and they would be one system with shared data with many users. That was really cool. And that just kept ramping up into the 90s and into the, into the century. And with the, with the advent of cloud, the idea of web services was implemented where we could serve data out over the web openly, and you could grab this service and that service, and you could match them together, and you could create new maps. This was like doing the same thing inside of a database, but it was distributed all over the place. So now there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these servers that are plugging into the web, and we're using the web to interconnect these services. So I'm grabbing this term called geospatial infrastructure and in your body you have a nervous system you have a central nervous system in the brain you sense things you cognate about these senses oh, this is hot this is warm that's and you also anticipate the future in your brain based on what you see and then you act now uh, this is this is human nature as it would be called if we step back and we look at the whole world we're we're wiring up the world with real-time sensors and these are geographically related. And for the GIS professionals of the world, this means 
wow, we could have take all the data that we're measuring um, and geo-reference it and webize it, serve it, and then bring it together like a nervous system for the planet. I like to call that geospatial infrastructure. So, you know, um, uh, Kendrick, when I was much younger, I remember Bill Gates saying, you know, what I have in mind is getting a desktop on everybody's desk. Nobody actually believed it. I actually didn't believe it. The advent of $100 desktop machines, and he made his software available to Later, uh, Tom, uh, Ted, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, someone who I would regard as a personal friend, invented the World Wide Web. And he said, my vision is, Jack, I want to connect all these machines, both the desktops and all the servers. I want to have every computer in the world connect. I thought, oh, you know, bullshit. <laughs> this is really not true. Right. What are you talking about? Because, I mean, that's not going to work. But look at the way it is today. So this morning, what I was trying to get across is that my vision, this is Jack's vision, I want geography, the science of our world, with all of the rich analytics and patterns and relationships that GIS practitioners can bring to be in every organization in the world, every, every government, not just big governments that are, you know, have a lot of money, but every little government in every developing country. I want it in every business. So that every business can be more efficient. They can, they can understand all the impacts that they're creating in business and avoid them. And I want it in every NGO, every conservation group, every, um, you know, uh, humanitarian group, every, every school. I want every school to teach not just the concepts of geography, but I want them to deal with digital geography. I want them to, and how are they going to do this? They're going to access it through this network which is the combination of computing, distributed computing, with all these measurements, real-time measurements coming into it, and, and integrated so I can overlay and integrate different kinds of data. I can integrate uh, pollution and then integrate in, say, breast cancer in Long Island. And I can see these are interrelated, and I can see the patterns. Man, that, that could empower new kids. You know, empower every child to see and think holistically. So these other technologies, and we hear a lot about this in the news, we're going to digitally transform organizations. Okay? I want to scientifically transform organizations. And that power, the idea of bringing it all together, seeing like you and I do holistically, the issue. you don't just see it in this sector or that sector, you don't see it in this community or that community, you see the whole. And that's the power of geography, the science of our world, and it's, I think, what we are building. And I can't do this alone. I don't have that kind of power. But through partnerships, like the kind of partnership you and I have, we learn to trust each other, share, and that means every technology company, it means every science organization, it means Every big business, like these huge businesses like Salesforce or IBM or Microsoft, I always think of these as my partners. I can connect, um, you know, and they, they provide different pieces of this whole infrastructure coming into being. Um, so this isn't a jack thing. I just, I see what I just can't. I see that this is going to emerge and it's going to be a platform that will address the big issues that we're facing, the challenges of overpopulation, the challenges of, of uh, inequality, the challenges of environmental sustainability, the challenges of climate change. We can't do this as individual orgs. We can't do it as individual governments. We, don't, we lack the ability to have cohesive political leadership in this, and you know exactly what I mean. We, it's got to be at the bottom. It's got to start at the bottom. The revolution has to start at the bottom. It means everybody has responsibility for these pieces. And they have an open heart and an open mind to collaborate, collaborating with competitors, collaborating with different people that you can leverage, building that kind of social fabric as well as technology fabric is where I think it's going to go. And we, God only knows that, um, considering the way that the trends are in this world, we, we got to figure it out. I mean, you know, 
something that occurs to me right now is that this uh, virus epidemic is bringing the world together in ways that we've never seen. Not at least not in my lifetime, because it's something that's a foreign force. But um, and it's it's it is really scary. People. That's why we pass over developer summit here, because people were afraid to come. Well, imagine that people actually got clear, like they did with the coronavirus maps, so, that about the big challenges of climate change and the big challenges of what's happening with with income equality and the big challenges that's happening with with social conflict in various countries causing huge migration. All of these things came into focus. So GIS, um, it's this language, I call it a language, that's a language, it's kind of language, like words are a language, uh, is able to express and mobilize the world to address these common problems. So it isn't, you know, you should, you should be careful of your side of the boat because the water's using the other way. No, <laughs> no we're, all, we're, all we're all going down, right? Going yeah, down. Absolutely. So we start to figure out ways that we can actually leverage each other. And I know that you, you in your life, have been all about doing exactly that, like trying to figure it out, wrestle with the, the difficult and nasty problems that we were all trying to solve. Um, so one of the things I, I could just tell you, uh, from a company perspective, we're still a new kid on the block, but um, I'm actually working on my PhD soon, so we're not going to work. Hopefully, <laughs> uh, so we're we're working on. I'm working on my PhD, but one of my my dissertations is going to be on geostem in a uh, diverse um, African-American kind of centric piece of it. But really, how do we, I, I know a lot of my friends who have STEM programs, yeah. but I haven't seen a lot of geospatial STEM programs. So what we are developing is the Spatial GIS Saturday Academy, where we're going to be going in the communities that we are servicing to be able to teach these kids GIS and geospatial services, right? And, 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 and really provide what I have been blessed to kind of play in uh, this game or of this uh, trade craft of GIS, um, even from the intelligence side of the house back to when I worked at FEMA, from an emergency management perspective, I've had a very good career in work. But one of the things we're really focusing on is there are a ton of kids in inner city Baltimore. I know we have an issue in Baltimore, Maryland with squeegee kids, right? If we could get them in front of a uh, collector or we could get them survey one, two, three and teach them how to make money, get uh, buy them drones to teach them how to fly drones, then we're teaching them a very strong skill set that allows them to come into this industry. But it's very hard because it, you know, I think I told you before, they, they don't see a lot of us, like minority-owned uh, businesses. So we really, um, they really don't get to, to see that I have the potential. And I told you about my potential and why I started my company. But we, we, as my company, we're trying to focus on how do we really teach those kids and GeoSTEM to me, I think is a very powerful tool, not just for spatial GIS, but I think for all of us geospatial partners and uh, as partners with Esri, but more than anything, all of us who are in the geospatial trade craft, regardless if we're partnering or not. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's, a, I really am proud of you. Yeah. Because you are laying the footprints for others to follow. Yeah. And, um, did I ever show you the little video we made with Will I am? You did. Yeah. And I, I, the beginning of that video it basically starts them off. Hey, here we are in Roosevelt High School, and he points at this uh, graffiti on the wall. Says, mm -hmm. "Right behind this, where the lottery map was, that's where I grew up." And he um, he talks about it, uh, and he pioneered bringing GIS STEM right into his old school. And the lessons there are: he's an African American. Of course, he's privileged. Yeah. He got onto a ramp through music and got him out of that place. Uh, his mom stayed there and still teaches there. But he moved out. Um, he didn't get promised that uh, playing basketball was going to get him out. Well, some future is that. Yeah, sure. No, football or like that. Not that I'm against sports, but yeah, you know, I like yeah. the dogs, I like, you know, whatever. But he uh, went back in there and pioneered this idea of bringing real STEM into the ground school. And that's an opportunity for everyone. Um, every income level, every racial minority background, every whatever. It's an opportunity for all of us. And why is it an opportunity? Because 
Uh, once I had the opportunity to meet President Obama, I was telling him about Matt. Did I tell you this point? Mm-hmm. So we were chatting, we were just going to do a second term. And I said, no, oh, Mr. President, I, I don't have math in government. He said, oh, I need that. What kind of math do you know? I said, Mr. President, it's about every math that you've ever seen. Right, right. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, bar, girls. And uh, he got really enchanted. So he pioneered this idea of um, um, getting tech companies to donate technology, hardware, software, into a control environment. Uh, I don't even remember the name of his program. But anyway, I stepped up. Okay. You know, it wasn't that bad about the speakers. It was, um, uh, anyway, he worked with the Secretary of Education and made this happen. So we timidly said, okay, we'll start with ArcGIS Online. And ArcGIS Online, we started giving to schools. And then we said, okay, let's go all in. We said, okay, let's go all in. So we gave it to free ArcGIS Online together with the cloud support that supports it to 100,000 schools in America. Well, that didn't do so much, but we did get 6,000 schools that signed up. And so last fall, about 340,000 kids registered in ArcGIS Online and did various lessons. So Roosevelt is one little tiny footprint. But right across America, we see almost even dots based on population of GIS professionals who adopted a classroom or adopted a school and helped the teacher get literate and then come alive with ArcGIS Online. So story maps um, and, and, not, and curriculum of various types. And these, these curriculum deal with observing a problem by a kid, uh, you know, well, measuring the problem, you know, like uh, pollution in the neighborhood or loss of this or that, and then coming up with a solution by the kid. Not somebody telling them, but the kid picks their own problem, the kid picks their own ways to measure the data, the kid, and, and it could be using things like collector, they measure their data, or they collect data from them, and then they take on the active role of trying to fix that problem, like lead poisoning in Detroit, like um, hurricane evacuation in South Carolina, or uh, planting trees on eroding hillsides in Kenya, or it just goes on and on. So then we decided to do it worldwide. So those of you uh, members who are listening to this program globally know that every school, any country can now get free support from us for ArcGIS Online, that's computing, software, whatever it takes. But my real experience is that teachers are too busy. I mean, my sister is a teacher, so you know, she's just too damn busy. She can't learn. So adopting a classroom, uh, adopting a teacher and helping them bring it in, like uh, Will helped me do in Roosevelt, just makes things come alive. Uh, so it's a repeatable pattern is what I'm saying. I, I, I'm talking too much. You're not asking enough no, questions. That's right? fine. No, no, it's, it's great. Uh, so one, I know that, that we have an audience of international folks. Yeah. So the sticker you have, uh, I think I was telling you last, the last couple of weeks, we have been giving away stickers yes. uh, to anybody who asked for it, right? Just yes. stickers at spatialgis.com. And, and I have sent over 100. Yeah, to I want you just to know that. <laughs> I stuck it right on. Uh, so we, I've sent stickers to Nigeria, uh, India, across the country, right? Just from LinkedIn. But um, I, th- one of the things I think, because uh, we really talk about U.S.-based type of approaches, or um, from an international perspective, I and, and I'll go to the millennial side of it, because a lot of people that are connected to me are millennials, right? From an international and also from a minority, minority perspective, right? So what would be your, what, as you've been in, in, in this space for quite a while, what do you feel but what words can you give to minor? I mean, excuse me, millennials in regards to how to get in space, how to trek through the geospatial uh, uh, tradecraft, mm-hmm. either being a GIS manager, uh, running like like I did with uh, be the be an internet uh, a IMAT leader at FEMA. Like it took me a while to get to that space. I wore the NGA. It took me a while to uh, to be more senior. And now being a CEO, what would be your 
words of wisdom to kind of help them get to. And I thought we talk about collaboration, the other things we talked about today. But what would be your kind of words of wisdom? Well, my thought is you have to you have to like what you do in life. And my impression of you is you do. You know, you really do. So I don't know what the hell turns you on and got the light went on. Uh, I mean, I remember when I was still in school, the light went on for me one one afternoon. And I thought, oh man, I could, I could, I could take the design work that <clears throat> I could take the design training that I learned in school, and I could use computing. This was again 50 years ago, before you were born. Use computing and systems analysis to actually do something with my life. And it was really awkward. It was really crazy technology, but I I got excited about it. And so then I just started doing little projects, and I got out of school. There was no place to work, so that's when I started S3. And I did it without money. I did it just with my own interest. I sort of was curiosity-driven, and gradually I felt like uh, I'd take this step, and then the next step, and the doors kept opening. And I am sure that that happened in your career. So every young person, every millennial, has to look, what is it that I really like? And not necessarily what's going to get me money, or what's going to get me the symbols of, of uh, you know, uh, a good life. But actually, what do you like to do? If you like music, man, play music. Uh, if you if you like to really, you know, wh- whatever gives you the excitement, that's what you should really follow. And that's what happened to you. That's ha- what happened to me. So I'd just say, every single person that's out there in your audience should just say, hey, well, is this what I want to do? And so let me make a case for doing geospatial, if that's what you want to call it, or digital geography, which I like. The case is virtually all the basic fundamental problems in the world right now uh, at all different scales in your neighborhood, in your city, in your state, in your businesses, in your in our countries, and in the world itself are, are spatial. And and mapping and geography provide us a framework within which we can do these work. Uh, this work, it, it allows us to both understand history, it allows us to see what's going on right now, and it allows us to imagine what could be geodesign, geoaccounting, uh, geoanalytics, geoindividualization. Geography is such a, a powerful science. So, you know, I, I can't really tell you I can't motivate people. They have to see it themselves. They have to want to go after this. And um, I, I think one thing I can say about women and professions is that GIS is a great place to go. It's a great space. It gives them opportunity to move much faster because there's not these old uh, people that are hanging out saying, you can't get into my profession. And the same is true with minorities. Huge opportunity for minorities. But every time I see somebody like you, I want to help. So uh, any way that I can help you, as, as you know, uh, be part of my business or provide you with technology to help you business go. Um, I'm just hungry for that because I can see what I can see. Uh, just like Will said, he saw music as a way to get out and follow his career, and he's good at it. You get a geography and the. The opportunities with this stuff are just immense, man. I mean, you know that. Uh, so, uh, and the opportunities to also just, at a personal level, contribute, uh, make a difference with your life. This is big. So, so as we get, I know a lot of people. I've been champion. I think the reason I actually I met you close to twenty years ago. I yeah. was interning, and I met you at the State Department when I was at NASA. Uh, I came to the Edger Conference as a student assistant, and I sat down with you just like we're doing now. Yeah. And I said, Mister Dangerman. Nobody in this room looks like me. How can we change that? Yes. I was at FEMA. I said the same thing. This is before I started my company, Mr. Danger Man. People still don't like me. Yeah. How can we, how can we help change? And so from a diversity perspective, and I know you did black CGIS. I know that people were kind of, uh, that was the first time, uh, in the UC's, uh, history that we kind of got, you know, our, uh, people of African diaspora to come together. What, what is your vision from a minority, uh, from my diversity perspective of this trade craft and also our relationship with Esri, what do you see on what ways we can kind of help? Uh, I just want to sh- shine lights on good footprints. 
that's my only way. I can't say, you know, but I, I, what I can do is shine light on good work. Your work is good work. Um, my good friend Paulette Brown, good work. And she's a community builder in the market here. So if I can support her supporting the growth of diversity, that's what I can do. Every time I get a minority in my company, I want to make sure that they have not just equal chance, but hopefully better chance. And so, like I say, everybody's got to do their own job. They got to do their own thing. Um, and so, just want to tell you, I got in Jari Fee uh, at Fayetteville State University. Fayetteville State University is a minority, is a HBCU uh, right. in North Carolina. Right. We're a um, we're USGIF certified. There's only two uh, HBCUs: North Fayetteville State University, North Carolina Central, where USGIF uh, certified. Uh, Drake, who's working with me as well from Jackson State University. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of, uh, Tennessee State that, that I don't want to name all of the HBCUs, but there are a lot of historically black colleges and universities. A lot of our chancellors, I know at Fayetteville, she's now working to kind of champion geography. I know that a lot of schools have kind of dismissed or changed up. I know North Carolina Central is also, I mean, North Carolina A&T is also, they have geomatics. Um, but one of the things that we are, and I'm as a, CEO, I'm really trying to champion connecting with HBCUs, mm-hmm. and um, I know this is a kind of a pitch to Esri is to say, and I know that Jeff really feels very uh, candid about uh, supporting historically black colleges and universities yeah. as well, and so um, I just want to say thank you for the work you've done, but more than anything, we want to be able to bring uh, opportunities for those students who are in the geography make. I'm probably one of those kids that kind of came through the uh, the path of the student citizenship program and I've been uh, blessed to have a good career. But one of the things I want to also do is to kind of give that opportunity back to some students. So hopefully that myself and some other of our CEOs can work with you to kind of empower those HBCUs to kind of yeah. to, to build and have I'm opportunities. I'm totally in to support you, but I can't do your work. Mm-hmm. You've got to do it and you've got to ask me what you want me to do. And that's, that's typically what I do in everything in my life is I figure out Find people that really want to do what I want them to do, <laughs> and then just get on their wagon. And I, I think you're you're right on uh, with even just asking me these questions. And it frames it in such a way in my mind. I really want to support you and every other minority in our field. And uh, because I I think it's a limitless opportunity. It doesn't have some of the barriers that some of the other professions have. That's what I guess I'd say. So let's blow it open. That's what I'd like. Well, Mr. Dangerman, I know that we have gone on uh, 30 minutes and I know this is a 30 minute interview. I want to just say personally, uh, I, I know I've sent you emails uh, and I have known you since that time and I'm blessed to be in this trade craft. Um, I thank you for, I, I think every time silently I may ask you and Jeff, uh, but you and Jeff Peters have been great, uh, not only partners but mentors I also call you a friend uh, because you've been great to me. And um, I do appreciate you uh, taking this little bit of time with us. And I know uh, I usually want to give you a couple minutes to close out. And then after that, we will be done. But if there's anything you want to say. Only the feeling is totally neutral. You know that. And uh, look, I screw up. We all screw up all the time. But uh, if we're going to create a better future, we just have to course correct in relationship by good communication back and forth. So to all of uh, you who are listening, uh, I want to say thanks. Thanks for bringing this particular subject up. Thanks for the work that you do and the various aspects of your of your efforts. And uh, we got a we got a big road ahead of us to if we're going to make this thing turn around. And I, I'm quite serious. This is not a time where we have any time for messing messing up. We got to go all in. So I'm all in. I really want to encourage all of you to go all in in our field and make a better future. You know, maybe I'll say this. Humans, they like to uh, aspire to be better. Don't you like to aspire to be better? And uh, so we've got now 8 billion of us aspiring to get more, improve, improve our lives. And technology has allowed us to really do that all over the planet. Now, the difficulty is that there's actually just too, too darn many of us. And it's a serious thing that I say. 
too damn many of us. Uh, people, great scientists like Ed Wilson and Peter Raven have said, okay, maybe it's three to four billion that's really sustainable. So maybe there's twice as many people as we can actually sustain. Because the Earth has a finite amount of resources that it can support. We keep growing and we keep aspiring to consume more and do better. So that isn't going to work out. Long-term. We're over the edge. So I, I think uh, we can all do better. You know, don't pollute, recycle, do things more efficient. And GIS is helping a lot of that stuff. But also outside of the GIS field, we all, I want to start a conversation that says we got to lay out a 25 or 50 year plan to reduce population quite a bit. And it's happening in some places like in Japan. It's happening in, uh, uh, in some Eastern European countries and the Soviet Union, but it's got to continue down really radically faster. And people don't like me to say this. They really don't like me to talk about this subject, but I guess I'm just going to risk my career and say, I think we've got to lay out this plan. It's one of the big things that, that, um, is going to allow your kids or your families or your friends' kids to, uh, have a life. Otherwise, it isn't going to work out because it's going to eat, it'll be ecological collapse because we're, we're just, we're going to burn out. So I, I don't like that idea. I really want to start talking about that as a subject. So for all of you listening, I'm not saying don't have children. I'm simply saying think about this because we're going to have to, this is one of those big social dilemmas of how do we come to grip with, um, you know, with, with cutting back in our fundamental population. Well, listen, guys. This is uh, I wanted to say, Mr. Daniel, thank you for being right. our first our first guest. Um, many more to come, uh, right. but I, I thank you again for this opportunity. For those who are tuning in on LinkedIn Live, this is the first of many th- throughout this year. This is the end of this session of Spatial GIS Geo Talks. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I pray that everything works out for you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks. Mm-hmm.